our panelists here. And we're going to start with uh, Jim McKelvey and his presentation, What is Lean and How Does It Impact uh, Patient Safety? And Jim was also um, at CASTI's annual meeting and conference last year. And for those of you who were also present, he was part of the Lean presentation and workshop that we did at that CASTI conference. So Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Darlene. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jim McKelvey. And uh, as mentioned, I'm the Lean coordinator here at CHEO. Um, our first slide is uh, just a, a, a brief update on some of the activity that's been going on at CHEO in regards to Lean. Um, Lean started here about three years ago uh, in ED and has since uh, moved uh, to other areas of the hospital. But our first endeavors in uh, ED, um, as you can see from the slide, have been quite successful. Um, we did uh, a split in patient flow, uh, basically uh, creating two sort of uh, patient lines, one for the acute zone and one for the ambulatory zone. And um, as a result of, of that effort, um, we've had uh, significant improvements in length of stay, reductions in length of stay for both high and low acuity patients, 11% uh, and 16%. And we've also seen a significant uh, improvement in uh, initial assessment time for physicians, both high and low acuity. It's interesting how um, when we split the flow, focusing on segregating low acuity and creating that, that patient flow, it had a positive impact on high acuity as well. Uh, a pretty classic uh, lean experience in, uh, in many ways. And another, uh, another project, one of a few that we've done in ED, but one that I thought relevant to this topic on patient safety, is um, we uh, created a small project around blood specimen mislabeling. And as a result of that effort, uh, through uh, spaghetti mapping and team building and understanding the process and value stream mapping, some things that I'll get into in a few minutes, um, we have effectively reduced travel for nurses by an estimated 89 kilometers a year and also reduced uh, the wrong labels applied to blood specimens by 28% over the last year. Uh, we still have some uh, opportunities around double signatures. We're not uh, compliant as we'd like to be in that area. And uh, that team is, in fact, continuing that effort, again, in the spirit of lean. Uh, continuous improvement, many small steps, and try something. And if it doesn't work, come back and try something different. Uh, that team is continuing to look at ways that we can improve that or reduce that double signature error. Uh, and then, as a result, reduce the number of um, times that patient need the patient uh, needs to be uh, to have blood drawn, uh, which is a huge issue when they're when we're dealing with little children. Um, and another area that uh, we've just embarked on in the last six to nine months is in our perioperative services. And uh, I'll show you in a minute some uh, activity we're doing there around improving uh, all sorts of uh, parts of the process. There's uh, about seven or eight different projects that we have on the go, looking at anything from block scheduling to first case starts and room turnaround uh, as opportunities to improve patient access to our to our perioperative services. So before I get uh, too far down the path, um, I thought I would talk a little bit about what is lean. Um, it's kind of a, a nebulous uh, thing. It, it depends on a little bit on who you speak to. Um, but uh, in, in essence, the engagement of those people who work within a process uh, to continuously look for, root out, eliminate waste, or what Lean calls non-value-added activities as defined by patient. Very important um, wording here uh, in, in truly understanding what Lean does. Uh, this first part about engaging frontline staff, it's uh, as the iceberg icon uh, kind of portrays, it's about capturing and engaging a wealth of information and energy within the organization that uh, often tends to be overlooked. And by engaging them, 
the people who work in that process. You're tapping into creativity and uh, real experience and understanding and appreciation of the processes to build a better process and eliminate waste. Um, the second part, eliminating non-value added. Um, often what we do when we're not sort of lean oriented is we tend to look at uh, the value added part of the process and try to streamline it, this little green slice of pie. And um, we might be able to, to, to trim 5 or 10% time or waste off of it. But when you look at the entire process from the perspective of the patient, uh, there's this huge amount of waste that tends to go unnoticed until we get sort of lean type glasses on that uh, we, don't, we don't focus on. And uh, as a result, uh, we, we end up working harder and faster when in fact there's, there's better ways of improving the process. And then thirdly, the continuous improvement uh, aspect is, is hugely important in Lean. This is, Lean is not about uh, the, the, the proverbial Hail Mary pass. It's about many, many small steps. And in some cases, as the sort of green line implies, uh, there's steps backwards. There's, there's mistakes made. We try something, it doesn't work. That's OK, because it's a small step. And we're learning. And we take that learning, and we move forward, and we build a better process as a result. And uh, as a result, there's a continuous improvement uh, element that uh, we gain benefit uh, longer term, rather than waiting until we implement that, that perfect uh, IT solution or system uh, as a good example of often what we wait for. So um, continuing in what is lean, as I mentioned, um, recognizing waste is is um, a challenge uh, when we're not practiced in in understanding what waste really is, and um, so people that aren't uh, practiced in lean uh, tend to think of waste, and and there is of course waste, the natural kind that we look at, the things that are thrown out, the medications, and so on. But there's a lot of other types of waste that are are not so easily understood or recognized. And uh, lean is categorized waste into seven or eight different uh, categories, as listed here. Um, and probably the one that's most specific to safety, in this case, would be errors. And uh, so I labeled the incorrect labeling of blood specimens as an opportunity. Um, but there's others, like overproduction, uh, where we, we, we request unnecessary diagnostic procedures, sort of just in case. Uh, transportation uh, to, back, to and forth from labs and so on, um, waiting, employees or patients waiting, uh, excessive inventory or inventory thrown out because uh, it's out of date, uh, motion, uh, this is where we saved a lot of time with the, uh, and traveling with the nurses, uh, taking blood specimen uh, samples, and uh, over-processing, collecting too much data, and this eighth one, uh, some might say, is not a, a lean waste. It's, a, it's sort of a, a, an orphan, if you will. But um, it is part of that lean philosophy of engaging uh, the employees and collaborating with them in problem solving and, and using them to, to influence their world. It's a, it's a very, very powerful part of the lean process, very, very important. Um, how to find waste, moving to the next slide. Um, so, so if we learn you know, how to sort of define waste, then we need these tools and techniques and principles by which to find it. Um, we need to, to, for example, value stream, value stream maps. Some of you may be quite familiar with that in Lean. Um, and I'll show you a, a, a picture of one in a minute that we, we used in uh, Periop. Uh, but this idea of systems thinking is probably the most important aspect of uh, creating a lean culture. Uh, and really, it's about creating a safe place to learn, or in other words, a safe place to change. Uh, people, when people feel threatened or, or um, basically threatened, they tend to uh, not open up and, and resist change. Uh, this idea that it's the process that's creating the problems, not the people. 
um, starts to break down that that uh, sense of holding your cards close to your chest and not speaking up. And uh, it helps people open up and really start to discover the opportunities. It's very important in a lean organization to uh, create that uh, systems thinking idea. Um, it creates a collaborative root cause analysis uh, uh, culture, looking for root cause, uh, asking five whys, asking why five times to understand what's really going on. We may answer the first question superficially. Um, it's because of so-and-so. Well, why is so-and-so doing that? And lo and behold, as you start to continue that questioning and digging, you really start to discover the processes that are causing the problems. Another huge aspect of uh, lean, uh, a lean culture is being data-driven. Uh, the saying goes that uh, without data, you're just someone else with an opinion is so true. And everybody has opinions, and, and they're not to be uh, dismissed by any stretch. But without data, it becomes very challenging to, to get to the root cause and really start to take steps to correct the root cause. So data becomes a, a very significant uh, aspect of a lean culture and a lean organization. And um, a, another very, very important aspect of lean is that things as, uh, should be as, as visual as possible. Um, you know, having data in your pocket or on a computer screen or on your email is, is fine, but it doesn't help on the day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute activities that are going on. If you think about driving a car, you're getting lots of feedback all the time, and it's very visual, very stimulating and it helps you keep the car on the road and do the right thing. We need that same kind of visual stimulation in a lean culture to keep the processes uh, doing what we want them to do. Those are a few of the, of the uh, tools and techniques that uh, a good uh, lean organized or lean orchestrated uh, organization would follow. Here's an example of uh, a value stream map, uh, a rather complicated one that we just completed a few months back in our periop process. It uh, was created by two teams of about uh, 10 to 12 people per team. And uh, we went through uh, the periop process from decision to treat to patient discharge. Uh, going through each step and understanding all the different issues and aspects and elements of each step. Um, the value of doing this in a team environment starts to poke at this, this value of collaborative problem solving and, and learning um, where, <coughs> excuse me, where people uh, really start to understand how the processes work and don't work. And um, it was a uh, very beneficial, very valuable uh, part of, of uh, creating the ideas, coming up with the ideas and the projects, those seven or eight projects I mentioned earlier uh, from Periop. Um, as you can see in some of these, like these the little stars, you can see red dots around the stars. Well, those were areas where there was significant, uh, the teams recognized significant opportunities. And as a result, we identified those as projects we wanted to go and, and address. When it comes to uh, who owns patient safety, um, I think one of the one of the problems that we we have is that uh, it's it's owned by everybody, uh, and as a result, it can often sort of as a result of that be owned by no one. Um, uh, when we when we have a good lean organized or or, or a lean culture in an organization, we have good feedback loops that take the the process, the information, uh, and, the, and the, the process of creating value, and we measure its outputs. And that's where the data comes from. And we provide feedback to the inputs of the process to keep it into control. And unfortunately, what we, what we tend to do without a lean organization or a lean culture is we focus on the process only, and we don't do well at designing the feedback loops. Uh, the feedback loops are, are a significant uh, part of uh, a good lean culture where the feedback loops contain things like what does success look like? What is it we want? What are, where do we want this process to, 
to go and, and where is it today? Uh, what resources do we have at our disposal to maintain the process, to execute, to create that value or provide that service? Uh, what uh, processes should we follow? A very important aspect of a lean culture is standard processes wherever possible. Not always possible, but wherever it is. Uh, standard processes are, are a significant uh, tool for reducing waste. And so when we look at processes and we bring people into the processes, we should be defining what are the processes, helping them follow them. And fourthly, what's the accountability? How do we hold people accountable? This is a, a very challenging part of a good lean culture, is, is walking the talk. Um, and following through, we, we say safety is important, but are we following through at the end of each day or week or month and saying to everybody, how are we doing? This is great. This is not so great. These projects are on the go. Holding people accountable to, to achieve that vision. And then consequences are another very, very important part of the feedback loop and that we, we need to understand. Often it's intrinsic, but we need to understand what are the consequences of not succeeding, of not reaching our vision, uh, what's going to happen. So uh, a feedback loop is a very, very important part of um, a good lean culture. And an example, a couple of examples in our emergency department, we recently um, have created a dashboard. This dashboard, um, of course, represents a lot of data. Uh, which is good. It's uh, real or semi-real time. It's updated about every three minutes and displayed in our emergency area and provides information to the nursing staff on how patients are flowing through the area and where they can focus attention uh, to try to keep uh, the flow running well and, um, and achieving the results and the vision that we want. Uh, another uh, example of a dashboard might be when I'm trying to sort of bring the patient safety element into this would be a patient safety dashboard. These are these are some uh, objects from our uh, safety reporting system that we in ED have started to use on a fairly frequent basis uh, as part of that feedback loop to tell the ED team how well we're doing in patient safety and uh, what we're going to do next, uh, helping the team plan what are we going to do next. Uh, in summary, um, I just wanted to sort of bring it back to uh, that lean culture and the idea that if we are engaging staff and frontline staff effectively, we're focusing on waste and we're thinking continuous improvement, it's a safe environment to, to make small steps, to suggest ideas, to make mistakes, uh, that in the end, um, this is this is the kind of culture that's going to be unstoppable and, and really address patient safety, waste, uh, streamline processes, and uh, create a much, much better healthcare system than we have today. And that is all I have. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I don't know, there's no questions or asked that I can see typed in, except Lennox just typed a question in. Uh, can you see those questions, Jim, or do you want me to read it out? No, I can see them just fine. Thanks, Lennox. Uh, it, what sort of training has been provided to frontline staff on lean? Um, most of the training has come through uh, the projects that we've done. Uh, when we've kicked off a project, I've gone through uh, the fundamentals of lean. We are just starting to embark on a yellow belt certification for a wide range of about 30 people here at CHIA um, that we're starting uh, to, to provide a, a broad set of training for more CHIA employees, but most of it's been through the, the project so far. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Uh, Jim, it's Darlene. Can I just follow up on a question for that? So if you're doing a yellow belt, is that an in-house training or are you bringing expert facilitators in? We're bringing uh, facilitators in to do that through OHA, I believe it is. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Are there um, any other questions for uh, Jim before we move on to our second uh, presentation presenter today? Okay. I have one question here from Barb Fitzsimmons. 
What type of electronic system do you have to help support the creation of your dashboards? Uh, great question. We have uh, two systems, one in ED and one in Periop. Uh, ED is um, a CETUS uh, system where we gather, we timestamp as the patient flows through the process. We timestamp uh, each step naturally through data collection. And that um, is used to uh, create uh, the da well, it's the, the foundation for the dashboard. The dashboard itself uses uh, SAP software uh, as a, uh, an additional application that draws the, the raw data in. Uh, and we, we uh, spent about uh, six months creating that, that uh, dashboard. Uh, it's just recently, in the last three or four months, it's been active. Um, in our periop process, we're using uh, Surgical Information System, SIS, which um, is a complete package and contains all the, uh, the necessary applications and tools to take the raw data, which is entered into it, and um, create dashboards as well as do uh, some really good analysis work. It's an excellent tool in my experience. I have no more questions at this time. So. Okay, thank you, Jim. That was an excellent presentation. Okay. Um, our second presenter is uh, Lennox Wang, and he's going to be uh, looking at combining lean and high fidelity simulations. Uh, so, Lennox, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great, thank you. Um, I actually have with me Diane Norman, who's my partner in crime in the simulation outreach program. Diane's actually been a key part of uh, the following two projects, which uh, we'll talk about. I also have Kevin Middleton, who's recently joined our uh, outreach team as well, too. So if some questions do come up, uh, I'm sure uh, Diane will be able to help me with uh, some of the answers. So there's a... Uh, oh, oops, let's get here. Uh, let me see if I can advance. There we go. Um, so I want to talk about two particular projects that, uh, where we've combined lean with high fidelity simulation. And just a bit of background, we have a hospital-based high fidelity simulation program. There's also a university one, but this, is, this particular initiative has really been hospital-based. We're in situ, which means that uh, almost uh, all of our work is done in the real-life hospital setting in patient rooms and patient settings. Um, and we've done a number of uh, things around evaluation of physical settings and human factors, including some field usability testing for our uh, equipment such as uh, ambu bags and, and, and the like. And we've also used it to orient staff and train new teams to clinical areas. So there's been a bit of background that's headed, uh, that's pointed our, our program in the direction of patient safety. The other bit of context is that our sites, uh, the Hamilton Health Science has undergone a massive redevelopment where our pediatric, our emergency department is now 100% pediatric and the adults are no longer seen here. Along with that, there's been a huge uh, capital project where we're building a dedicated pediatric emergency department in terms of the physical space. Coincident with this is that the, cor the broader corporation's quality specialists all obtained Greenbelt uh, Six Sigma lean certification. It's about two, two and a half years ago, I think now. Um, and, and I happen to uh, be a part of that and, and going through that course as well. Um, and then there's the added pressure, I'm sure uh, Jim is well versed in this with the, from the MOH, around uh, uh, process improvement in the emergency department specifically and also a number of pay for performance uh, pressures that are coming our way. So we thought this was the ideal way to, this is ideal setup in terms of uh, allowing us to combine these two areas. The first project we did was to look at the emergency room design. So oftentimes emergency, oftentimes patient areas are designed purely from blueprints and from mistakes made in the previous designs of patient areas. Um, sometimes you have mock-ups, rarely are they actually tested. So what we did is created two mock up we created a mock-up room based on uh, the original blueprints, so similar size, um, and created two 30-minute scenarios of respiratory arrest to try and test the layout of these particular rooms, um, and then used a couple of uh, lean tools to try and evaluate this too. So our project leads were, of course, trained in lean methodology, and we recorded this. 
um, and documented it to validate what we observed in the actual simulations. This is the blueprint of, uh, from uh, one of the architect's drawings of the patient care area, and this is a standard acute care room. This is a headboard drawing, so we looked at not just the layout of uh, things uh, within the room, but things uh, at the organization of things at the headboard level, too. Two main tools we used were uh, a tool called uh, 5S and 6S. Many of you on the line will probably be familiar with this. We think of this as a litmus test for lean because if you're not able to do this, you're probably not ready for it. some of the more complex lean uh, initiatives and, uh, that, that would follow. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these just in the interest of time, but really it's looking at the environment and trying to uh, optimize the environment for, uh, for use. And the second thing we did was spaghetti mapping. And I'm just going to scroll through a couple quick slides to show you uh, what that exactly meant. So this was, uh, again, the mock-up of the patient area. And what we did is we ran the code and we tracked the entry of people um, and the appearance of other equipment, like the Grosso cart you see there in the room. This is a grossly simplified spaghetti map and looked, uh, looks a lot neater than the, the map that we had at the end of the 30 minutes. Uh, traditionally, simulation is used in an educational format where it's really talking about uh, medical content expertise and team performance. But this was a very different tack, um, and we debriefed the entire team, also told them that they weren't being evaluated, that this is really more to evaluate the environment and try and uh, develop uh, a way of looking at the environment before we actually built the emergency department. Had a multidisciplinary team and also the capital uh, uh, development folks there too. and document a number of observations and try to group these and, and uh, guide the debriefing along uh, lines of, of lean. So a number of things were changed based on those lean principles, based on our spaghetti maps, and the room really had some significant reorganization because of that. Things that looked pretty good in, the, in an architect's drawing really turned out not to be very good in terms of practical settings. Uh, when it came to moving around in the room, accessing the patient as well. Just a little bit more about debriefing. We looked at that headboard and tried to group um, outlets, equipment mounts, switches by disciplines, and this came about directly as a result of the uh, high fidelity simulation that we ran in that room. So a couple of points from this particular project is that it really seems uh, like an optimal way to think about um, evaluating a particular patient area before you build it if you're doing renovations, if you're building a new, a new um, wing of a hospital or changing a, a new patient area, creating new rooms. It's safe, it's ethical, you don't have to wait until the patients actually get, get in the room to discover the faults of how a room is organized. Um, and you know, we thought it was a bit of an innovative way to take high fidelity simulation with those fancy mannequins and put it into a real patient setting. So where we are right now, there actually construction is well underway, uh, probably about a third of the way done with our emergency department. Um, the next step actually is doing a little bit of this today is to evaluate our trauma rooms and there's a mock-up that's been created. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do a similar uh, project with the trauma rooms within the emergency department. So I'm going to jump to the next uh, bit, and this is a value stream map mapping with which uh, Jim touched on. And again, not going through all of the complex steps of value stream mapping, but essentially pay, pay, putting yourself a starting point, stapling yourself to the patient in the context of healthcare, stapling yourself to, to a patient uh, as they journey through a particular set of processes. Wait times are essential. Uh, trying to capture 80% of the processes that take place is, is really essential, too. Um, and most of the time, the value stream mapping exercises I've been involved with tend to be classroom exercises, where you get a group of experts, content experts, into a classroom and try and create a map. Um, so again, taking things out of the classroom and putting them into a real life setting, we thought that there would be some value uh, in evaluating the value stream map that we created. The first step really was, well, there are two steps that happened simultaneously. The first is we needed to create an extended high-fidelity simulation 
This has never really been done before. Most simulations, most mock codes, people who are involved in mock codes last about five to ten minutes or so uh, with a debriefing that lasts about uh, 15, 20 minutes afterwards. Um, we needed something that was going to last hours because we needed the patient to go through every single step of the way in terms of being in the emergency department, waiting at different points, um, waiting to have tests done, waiting to go to radiology, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the first step from the simulation side of things. The second step was to create a value stream map, and this was uh, about a half day to a full day exercise, and again in a more classroom, conference room setting. Uh, this is just a portion of the value stream map that we created. Uh, and you can see some similarities to uh, how, and after it had been transferred to uh, a Visio uh, format, you can see some similarities to the value stream map that, uh, that Jim displayed. Um, so what we did is we identified for approximately 20, over 20 process steps in the classroom uh, VSM, and with various process times and wait times, uh, you see a couple of the examples there, things like triage, registration, primary uh, nurse assessment, physician assessment, getting labs, etc. And we ran our uh, simulation, which lasted, it wasn't quite eight hours, but it was uh, the better part of, uh, of the daytime, so probably about six hours or so. Um, and the existence of every single process step was confirmed in our uh, in, in situ exercise in the actual emergency department. So this, the, our high fidelity mannequin went through, was registered, system, underwent every single one of the steps that we imagined the patient would go through when we did our classroom exercise. And then we documented all the times as well. And most, for the most part, all of these times fell within the estimated ranges of the classroom value stream map. Um, screen over to the next step. These are some of the examples uh, you see on the left side were the classroom minutes which were estimated, right side simulation minutes. Um, there's a subsequent column, which I haven't put up there, where we went into our EDIS uh, data and said, uh, are we able to drill down and actually get um, real life minutes? And for some of these process steps, we were able to, because the next step after doing a value stream map is to try and identify key areas where you can improve uh, the processes. And we were able to do that, um, primarily around physician initial assessment uh, and time to physician initial assessment. Uh, so again, the, some conclusions from this uh, short exercise was that uh, we felt that there was some value in taking uh, something that would otherwise be done in a classroom and then confirmed by electronic data to, to the actual emergency department setting. It, it really showed that some of the things that's otherwise viewed as management or administration um, brought that forward to the frontline staff, and I think that was really important. It became very visible to show that... Uh, there was some thought put behind um, each of our exercises that we that we did and uh, why we were doing the subsequent steps, which is to try and improve our flow in the emergency department and optimize things like uh, time to physician initial assessment. So that's uh, it. A quick, quick overview of uh, two projects that uh, that have brought together our uh, lean and uh, brought together both lean and high fidelity simulation. We've, uh, we've presented some of this work at a couple of uh, simulation conferences in, in the U.S. and, and, uh, and overseas. Uh, very well received. There's certainly a lot of excitement in the simulation com community for uh, bringing lean into some of the work that's being done there. So, um, Kristen, I see you might have a question. I'm, uh, I've unmuted your line are you able to uh, are you able to ask your question okay there's no question okay my mistake sorry so I have no questions at this time so I think uh, uh, Darlene do you have any comments uh, no, not uh, not here. Other than to say thank you very much, Lennox, and we'll come back and open it up for discussion for all three panelists once our third panelist finishes, if that's appropriate. Okay.
And people, just to remind people to feel free to uh, type in your questions as we go along as well. So our third and final rapid fire panelist is Andrew Chen from the IWK Health Center, and he's going to be talking about building lean capacity for patient safety. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that's perfect timing. Earlier we have a question saying about what sort of training has been provided to the frontline staff for lean. So what did we do in IWK? We are building lean capacity for patient safety by offering workshop. So for the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you how we do it and why we're doing this. So the, as Jim mentioned earlier, patient safety is everybody's responsibility. And it is also one of our key strategic goals, keeping patients safe. In order to keeping patients safe, we need to develop a patient safety culture, as is shown on the slide. We, I'm, since it's a rapid fire, I'm not going to go through all of it. So we will put our focus in the right bottom circle, leading and learning. Next slide, please. So we talk about leading and learning, developing leaders, learning from patients. Again, earlier we heard from our panelists, patients know best. Patients know what is value for them. So we designed this workshop around this. So the goal of the workshop is to build capacity. We transfer the knowledge of lean to the people that know our patient the best. And also, we put the knowledge to the people that know their operation the best. It's our frontline folks. We realize that we need to transfer that knowledge in order for them to develop their own processes to their day-to-day -day operation. It will enhance ultimately to the patient care and patient safety. Next slide, please. So, give you an overview of what we have been doing for the past two years. This initiative was started by Darling Boulevard two years ago, and this is open to all IWK staff, not group, anybody willing to learn. We will give them a two and a half day training. This training initiative is facilitated by mainly by industrial engineers and also by our improvement consultants. Our improvement consultants have extensive knowledge in the clinical background, and they are helping us to facilitate the training that to ensure that the patient safety is the main goal of this workshop. Next slide, please. Give you a really brief overview of the course outline that we have for two and a half days. Again, Jim and also uh, Lennox mentioned about lean management. What's lean, lean management? What is waste? This is one of the main goals is to identify waste, to understand. Like Jim earlier mentioned, the teamwork, transportation, inventory, and so forth. And also we have a lot of activity with a paper airplane activity for them to understand. Uh, we want them to touch what the waste are, and they can understand how to eliminate them by doing some mock-up paper airplane folding exercise. And then we move on to rail stream mapping. We talk about some standard work and five S's, and I'm glad that I heard today is six S's. From now on, I will move on as six S's. And also, we have activity around that too. And uh, one thing about lean is the system medically approach to solve an issue, this DMAC approach. So one of the main focus that we have is problem solving techniques, is cause and effects. Fishbowl diagram is to show people how important it is to understand the problem they are solving. And also we touch base with PDSA, scale, psycho, Kai San, and so forth. And then at the end of the two and two day training, we are expected all the participants will go back to their day-to-day -day job and actually initiate a project. We are not looking for big, we told them. We want something small, something quick, that they can practice what they learned for the past two days. As a facilitator, we will help them to draft up what they need to do. Again, we are not going to spend a lot of time. We want something small, let them understand what real lean in the real world. And the purpose of the workshop is to put the knowledge in their head 
for them to practice. So this is the main goal. So by uh, doing a quick project, it really solidifies what they learned and what they heard for the past two days. Next slide, please. So at the end, of course, we have a certificate. We have the signature from some uh, from director and so forth to recognize the effort that people put their work aside for two days and have an initiative to learn about Lean. So we do issue a certificate after they complete the course. Next slide, please. So two years now, two and a half years in now, so what did we do so far? Again, I want to mention that it's open for all staff. We started two years ago. At this point in time, based on our record, we have 75 staff tra trained, ranging from administrative staff to director, clinical chief, clinical manager, clinical leader, and so forth. Again, we encourage people to take on project after they finish, but we understand our day-to-day -day job sometimes they cannot realize what they would like to do. So we estimate after about half of the participants able to carry on a small size project after completion of the workshop. I have more to share, but I understand the purpose of me talking today is a rapid fire. So we condense what we do to build capacity in five minute caption. So that's all I have to share about IWK building capacity in terms of lean. Thank you. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, any questions from um, anyone out there for uh, Andrew? I don't see any questions. Nobody's uh, written anything in. Um, you could also put up your hand. Oh, I have another one. What uh, process do you use to sustain the gains of your projects? We have we just to sustain the project. Of course, we have to monitor it. We, in our organization, we have SKPI. It's our key performance indicator. Those key indications of performance index will help us monitor the progress or the sustainability of the project. And I'll jump in as well. And one of the other things we've done, which is why we've added the half day, is because folks need to appreciate that it's an applied workshop and there is that expectation. So one of the things we developed after our first project is a quick little template that they can report back on their project. So we have kind of like a, a bit of a database on the projects. And as each um, within each subsequent workshop, we bring some of the folks who have actually successfully implemented the project back to actually talk about the project. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's some of the things we've built in so that it can sustain the utilization and ongoingness of the tool. Tracy, I've unmuted your line. Hopefully we can uh, hopefully you can talk to us. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh amazing. The technology is fantastic. Thanks everyone for their great presentations. My question was to IWK um, specifically because Part of the benefit of Lean in, and going through the learning is to engage staff. So of the 75 people or even the 33 that started off with other projects, did the project leaders have any challenges in engaging the staff in, um, in engaging colleagues to work along with them? Because, of course, the leaders would have had the opportunity to have that two and a half day training, which sounds fantastic. But how do you get the other people to work along with you to uh, to work on your lean improvements. I'll feel that one, Tracy, um, only for the simple reason that Andrew is our, uh, fairly new with us, so he wouldn't have the history on that. Um, so a, a lot of these 75 people are frontline staff, so it depends on what the project was. So it, even in advance of the two-day education sessions, they come in with a project in mind that would be near and dear to either themselves or the group that they would be working with in the um, within their work group or work area. So they come in with that and so they've had some opportunity to do some of that discussion in advance, like what would you like to see, what can we take on. 
So we build that even before they come to it. So um, some of the projects have been individually driven, which then doesn't necessarily um, engage staff. But even if they don't um, complete it, and the 33 projects are completed projects, so even if they don't complete it, there is some expectation that that knowledge gets transferred. Does, does that kind of answer the question? No, nope, that's perfect. That's very helpful. Thank you. And I find, and then also because I'm also working on a lot of different projects across the health center, and I can really pinpoint when I had in, in a meeting in a team, I can really understand which which player around the table have some lean background because when they talk, when they support the idea, they're not coming from one side; they're coming from the lean perspective too. So that is one of the goals that we want to achieve for the workshop building. And the projects can be as big or as little as they want to make it manageable. So somebody can just be 5 sing a work area with help and input from others, and others take on a much larger um, project as well. But we do try to say it's something that should be completed within, you know, four weeks or so. Um, Any other questions for either Jim, Lennox, or Andrew? Uh, nobody's written anything in at this point, but I'm just wondering, is there anybody else, uh, are there any other organizations online that have a similar um, um, a similar program running um, with lean workshops or some sort of lean training within, you know, that's, that's organized in this sort of way within their organization? It's uh, Lennox here. Yeah. Um, so at the broader corporation level, there, there were some initiatives to have uh, yellow belt training for um, managers and leaders across the organization. I think there are a number of uh, sessions offered um, at that level. But uh, what's been difficult, and this is where I'm interested to hear people's thoughts, is how do you really get that down to the frontline staff everywhere else? I mean, this is a, this is a huge organization. Um, and especially when you're talking about um, an environment where, say, it's a union environment where every single day is equal to money. Uh, two days for 10,000 employees is probably not doable. Um, so you know, I'm curious to hear people's thoughts on how do you get this sort of training down to that level for the frontline staff. A little bit easier when you're talking about physicians, especially academic physicians, um, to to get you know, a few hours here, a few hours there. But even then, for uh, to get uh, a couple of days both solids is incredibly challenging. And even uh, even not for the uh, yellow belt or that level, even just for the little one that we do, some of that uh, attrition drops off, and and it prim primarily is. Um, at the manager or director level, that gets called out of the two days, and the staff are the ones that are really the most committed when they attend. But it is a challenge, I agree. So, um, uh, Barb uh, Fitzsimmons, I've um, unmuted your line. I'm wondering if you're able to uh, to uh, speak, if we're able to hear you. I see you said that uh, you do uh, lean leader training at your organization, but perhaps because maybe your mic isn't, uh, you're not able to speak. Oh, she doesn't have a mic. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, um, uh, uh, Christina uh, says at our organization we have. Uh, broken training into two-hour modules and incorporated into monthly team meetings for frontline staff. So uh, again, Christina, I'm going to try to unmute you. Do you have a microphone? Um, nope. Okay. So uh, where are you from, Christina? Oh, Erin Oak Children's Treatment Center. Okay. So that's um, that's rehab, right? Yeah. And oh, Barb is saying 
Yes, uh, autism and speech therapy. That's from Christina. Um, and Barb Fitzsimmons is saying, we do three-day workshops along with applied training, which is to participate in an RPIW uh, lead and sub-lead along with module marathon. So maybe all of my lean friends can uh, explain what that means. I, um, so, does anybody have any thoughts? RPIW, is that what you said, Lisa? Yeah. I'm not familiar with, this is Jim McKelvey, I'm not familiar with that acronym, but uh, I am familiar with the, rather than trying to train an entire organization, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that I, I've called that sheep dip training in the past, where we sort of process many, 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 many people through and keep your fingers crossed that some of it's going to stick. Um, another, uh, with, and, a, and a, I think a more effective approach, is to be very selective about, uh, about creating champions that can um, facilitate projects within a department or group. Uh, they have a penchant and a knack and a skill and a desire and a, a passion. So um, they, it, it starts to permeate. You sort of plant seeds, and then the weeds grow all around it. The, it, 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 the, the culture and the thinking starts to permeate through action and experience rather than training. Some people just, you know, they go to a classroom and get training, and it just doesn't stick. But if they're working with or experiencing somebody who's really passionate about it in their area, um, it's a different process, it's a different way of learning. And so you don't necessarily need to train a whole lot of people uh, in, in great detail, but you need to be very selective and create a program where you follow through, uh, you make sure that the, the people that are trained are, are initiating projects within their areas. And, um, and I really like the idea uh, that, I think it was IWK, of um, you know, sharing at the end of each project. That's a fantastic way of spreading that culture without necessarily having to train a lot of people. I think, I think that's a very good technique. And so Barb is uh, telling us, so RPIW is Rapid Process Improvement Workshop, which is a, a week-long team event. Uh -huh. And uh, so and they also they started with their leaders in the organization and put them through the process, and it's uh, a, a certification. And uh, they have a strict accountability process uh, back with audits, quarterly reviews, and etc. cetera, to, to leadership. So they're reporting back as well, so that's great. That's that's Lisa, are there any, any other questions online before I uh, wrap up here? No, just there was uh, one question for the Yellow Belt training. How many days is it? Lennox, I think that's uh, directed to you. Yeah, to be honest, I can't recall what our uh, broader institution set it up as, but I know that there's a little bit of variation. OHA has a standard yellow belt training. Um, I don't know, Jim, do you recall? Or, or yep, it's two days. Two days, yeah, that's what I figured. Oh, okay. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so just in respect for time, I think I'll wrap up, and I'd, I'd like to very much thank Jim for his overview and his discussions are around uh, what they're doing there. Um, really interesting discussion about viewing uh, non-value added as defined by the patient versus as defined by the provider. I think that certainly uh, lends itself to culture shift in some organizations, as well as uh, who owns the patient safety and the recognition that we all do, but who has accountability for what pieces. I thought your dashboards were fantastic. So. Thank you for sharing all of those with us. Uh, Lennox, the work that you're doing with the high fidelity simulations is, is sounds really interesting, and um, how you make um, previously admin tasks more visible to frontline folks. And certainly one of the learnings that I'm going to take away, as Andrew already met, mentioned, is not talking about 5S, but talking about 6S, which incorporates uh, you know, patient safety into it instead of patient safety as an add-on or a afterthought to your 5F events.
So thank you for that. And Andrew, uh, thank you for providing the overview for the support for staff and the continuation of learning for uh, lean uh, in healthcare. So thank you to everyone for that. And um, as I noted in the beginning, uh, all of these presentations will be posted to the uh, CAFSI website after the event, so people can feel free to uh, go on and take them from there. And um, without uh, further ado, on behalf of Tracy Rong, uh, Lisa Stromquest, and myself, we'd like to thank everybody for uh, being online with us today. And just to remind you that the next call is going to be May the 27th at 11 o'clock Eastern Time, and that session is going to be Accreditation Canada and ISMT Canada is going to be talking about narcotic safety and standardized concentration. So we're hoping that each of you will be able to join us again for that time. So uh, thank you very much, and Lisa, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, and uh, I appreciate um, all the questions and comments, and we will be <coughs> the presentations on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network and um, on the CAN there is the um, um, you're able to post comments or ask questions uh, right on that site so if you go in and uh, you look at the presentation re you review it or you uh, show it to any of your other um, colleagues they can type questions in and we can uh, forward those to um, the powers that be to the people who would know those answers so uh, I hope that you can, uh, I'll send the link out to everybody, and uh, thank you very much, and have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Excellent call. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone.